I'd like to thank you all for joining us for September 2023's Work Camping Q&A session. I'm Jody Anderson Duquette here with Work Camper News. Uh, WorkCamper.com is our online home. If you guys aren't familiar with us, um, definitely please hop over to our website. Uh, we created the term uh, work camping back in 1987 and uh, started developing the community ever since. So all of the you know Facebook groups and other websites and everything that you see online nowadays all came uh, because we we started this ball rolling. And so uh, we are the only small business entity that works to help work campers and employers, both sides of the fence, um, help you guys learn as much as you can about work camping and how to recruit and retain work campers and hopefully find the best matches. Um, Cause when, you know, everything aligns, we, you know, we want everyone to be successful and have a positive experience with this. So uh, that's our goal with the tools and the education and everything that we provide. Um, we're, we're passionate about helping you guys be successful. So um, we had lots of questions submitted ahead of time. Um, I promise this isn't just going to be, you know, a sales pitch for work camper news. Um, I am going to show you some of our website tools and talk about some of that but um, the majority I'm just gonna you know kind of brain dump information on you guys now um, we had a couple questions submitted that um, were the same questions submitted last month that I answered so um, if I didn't answer your question go back to the recordings from previous ones because um, I answered it last time um, also we had some submissions that were just statements so I didn't know like what the question was and kind of how to go about that so um, if you guys do want to attend future ones if you could you know definitely please try to like get your question in there what you're asking um, and you're also welcome to contact us here at work camper news anytime uh, we're a small staff there's five of us here in office but you know we answer emails we you can call us us um, 8 to 4 30 Monday through Friday we're here in office but call email send us a message on our Facebook um, it, we're happy to help you guys as much as we can uh, whether you're a member or not but uh, if you haven't checked out workcamper.com yet please do all right so um, let's dive into the questions here uh, so this one um, we had you know at least kind of threw the question mark in there so I knew it was a question but very brief um, hours pay living not really sure how to answer the living don't really know um, what you were asking there exactly but uh, just kind of in general work camping is doing any kind of part-time or full-time work uh, while living in an RV so it really encompasses a lot of different things uh, most often you are going to see uh, the types of opportunities that are advertised are in the outdoor hospitality industry, uh, RV parks and campgrounds, of course, at the forefront, but there are also uh, lodges and tour companies, amusement parks. There are many uh, concessionaires that operate in and around national parks or cool tourist areas, national monuments, etc. cetera. Uh, they look for work campers to help them with their staffing. So. Um, a lot of different things, even just in that outdoor hospitality industry, but um, it expands even further. And we see things like, you know, um, Christmas tree sales, pumpkin sales is really gearing up now. This time of year, the fireworks stands, uh, gate guarding at oil fields. Um, there are just all kinds, just so many um, <laughs> positions out there and different types of opportunities. So, um, you know, whether you're someone who's looking to deal a lot with the public or not deal with the public at all, uh, there are, you know, opportunities that kind of match your personality and what you're looking to do, uh, especially if you can get into the volunteer realm, um, you can kind of open yourselves up to doing some, you know, unique things that you thought maybe you would never do before. Uh, but I encourage you guys, um, I'm going to hop over to my internet browser real quick. Um, I'm going to kind of go back and forth between the PowerPoint and the internet browser just so I can um, show you guys some resources and things. Um, this is WorkCamper.com. I'm actually logged in as a um, member right now, uh, but I want to direct you guys. Uh, we have a podcast and we have for whew, almost four years now, I think. Um, so consistently putting out new episodes every week. Um, we're the only work camping podcast that actually continues to provide new content and information for you guys. Uh, so we're at episode 245 right now. Um, that one just came out this week. We interview work campers, we interview employers offering the jobs, and also just talk to others in the RV industry, RV community itself. Uh, so 
Word Camper Show is the name of our podcast. So you can go to wordcampershow.com to listen to our podcast. Or uh, if you have a favorite app that you like to listen to podcasts in, just go to the search area and search for the Word Camper Show. Um, and that'll come up. You can subscribe and, and listen. We're in pretty much all of the major podcast streaming services. Uh, but I bring up the podcast because if we look for episode 200, uh, that's... Uh, Luke, uh, Luke is my husband um, and me, uh, I'm Jody, And so uh, we are the owners, operators of WordCamper News. And so we did this special podcast episode where we just went through 200 different work camping jobs. Um, we kind of tried to categorize them a little bit. And that doesn't even cover like the full gamut of the type of opportunities that are out there. Uh, you really just need to become a member and start consistently looking at the different job listings that are coming through the system and get your resume out there in the database so you can be found by employers because not all employers advertise. Some only look through resumes and find all their work campers that way. So. Um, just kind of scrolling through some websites and clicking here and there, you're really limiting your view of what's out there for you. Uh, but give this uh, podcast episode a listen. Uh, it might open your ideas to some different unique opportunities that are out there. And uh, kind of going back to our original question of hours and pay, that's really going to vary as well, uh, depending upon the entity and what they're looking for you to do, um, things like that. Like, obviously, if you're going to go work for maybe a nonprofit organization or a children's, you know, summer camp or something like that, like there's, you know, you're just working as a volunteer. There's not likely going to be pay involved, uh, you know, wages anyway, or, or if you go work for a commercial campground or an amusement park, that's a big business entity. There's going to be more money flowing through the system and likely they'll be able to pay you some wages and, and stuff like that. So uh, what we typically see um, in the work camping lifestyle is anywhere from working a few hours in trade for an RV site and typically hookups, some other perks, things like that. By hookups, I mean utilities, water, sewer, electric. Uh, there may be opportunities where the setup is you are going to work X number of hours per week in trade for your RV site. Any hours worked over that will be paid at a rate of whatever. Uh, others are you will be paid for every hour that you worked and we're going to provide an RV site to you at no cost. You may work, um, be paid for every hour worked, and then you are going to pay a fee for your RV site. Um, oftentimes, that's maybe going to be less than the traditional camping customer if it is a, a normal campground. Uh, but like, for example, those concessionaires and national parks, um, if you go work like for Delaware North and Yellowstone, I think your site fee is like 70 bucks a week or something to live in a full hookup site inside of Yellowstone National Park. Like that's a smoking deal. Um, so anyway, so it might be set up like that. Um, it could be they're going to, you know, pay you for all hours worked and you go find your own RV site because they don't have sites around that they're able to coordinate and offer to you. Uh, so there are even salaried positions out there or commission earning positions. So that's that's kind of the multiple different setups that we've seen and, and there may be some others um, in between. Um, whether or not the RV site if it's provided to you as part of your compensation, whether or not that's considered income to you and will be reported income to you, either via a W-2 or a 1099, that again is going to depend on the employer and the entity. So you want to be sure to uh, ask ahead of time those kinds of questions. So that way, when it comes time to do your tax return and you're getting W-2s or 1099s, there's a lot less surprises that are going to be occurring. And uh, with some folks who have, um, maybe you're on disability, social security, some kind of plans like that, uh, there are sometimes limitations to the amount of income that you can earn. And so knowing whether or not, you know, that uh, RV site value is going to be considered income what could sway whether you take a position or not. So. Um, again, uh, we lots of questions that need to be asked of an employer ahead of time before accepting the position, but you want to make sure you clearly know, you know, what your compensation is going to be laid out, how it's going to be, how it's going to be, you know, factored in, if there are any bonuses, sometimes employers pay bonuses. Um, so, yeah, and um, going back to that first part of uh, this person's question, asking about hours, again, that's going to vary as well. Um, if it's a position where you're just working in trade for an RV site, you might be working anywhere from, you know, 10 to 20 to 30 hours a week in trade for a site, depending upon what that site value is worth. 
Uh, there are definitely full-time positions available and where it's more like 32 to 40 hours a week that they're wanting you to work. Uh, some positions, you know, if you are uh, going to be a contractor and you're, you know, working as a 1099 um, contractor with that employer, uh, depending upon what type of what type of opportunity it is, uh, you may be setting your own schedule. So, you know, you might work more than 40 hours a week, you might work less than 40 hours a week, it's it's going to depend on the position and, and what you're doing. Uh, some opportunities are going to be, you know, like doing the Christmas tree, uh, sales lot, fireworks, pumpkins, etc. You know, that's probably going to be longer hours of the day, um, working those sales lots and stuff. Um, and like uh, sugar beet harvest is a very popular opportunity. Uh, that's actually taking place right now. It occurs in September, October. And work campers work at the receiving stations. They don't work in the fields. They work at the receiving stations where the farmers truck in their beets and dump them off to be piled. And with that opportunity, work campers are often working, you know, 12 hour shifts and there is potential for overtime as well. So it's a short-term opportunity. It could be as short as two weeks, could last as long as a month, uh, but very good pay involved there. And with that ability to add in overtime as well, you know, that just accelerates, um, you know, the compensation that you can earn. So yeah, hours pay definitely going to vary quite a bit depending upon the operation and the position that you're seeking and, and all of that fun stuff. Uh, one thing I do want to show you guys, so um, like I said, WorkHipper.com is our website. Uh, we are a membership service, a paid membership service. Um, it costs a lot of money to provide all of the things that we provide because um, we don't just put a website up and have it be the same for 30 years and fill it with those tracker banners and bury you in pop-ups and all that stuff. So. We are supported both by our Work Camper members and our employer members. So we're not beholden to either side of, of the, the equation here. Okay, so um, when you log in to WorkKeeper.com, we do have a free 30-day trial of our Diamond Level membership. Um, our memberships really are not expensive. It's $19.95, $47, or $67 for a whole year. Uh, so it's really, you know, equates to about four bucks a month when you go with that Diamond Level, which is the most popular. We have a free 30-day trial if you want to try it out for free for 30 days, so you can check it out first. Anyway, logged in here. Um, we have two job listing avenues for the, the main part. Um, our online magazine, and maybe you guys have seen physical copies of our magazine passed around here and there. Uh, we, we published a physical magazine for about 36 years, uh, 35 years, but um, the readership was declining and, and you guys just weren't even looking at the online version as much as you used to. So uh, we've discontinued new issues of the magazine, but we have left 100 issues online on the website. So um, each issue of the magazine has job listings organized by state as well as helpful articles and other information. So I definitely encourage you guys to peruse uh, past issues. A lot of our employers are with us for many, many, many years. And so if they have ever advertised for work campers and they're still in business, it's pretty likely that they are still going to hire work campers, assuming they haven't had a lot of negative situations. Uh, so definitely reach out if you see a listing, even if it was from you know a year or two ago, uh, but it kind of seems to check all of your boxes, I wouldn't hesitate to reach out to that employer and see if you know they have any openings coming up. So uh, check out the online magazine uh, just for some you know historical, it's a, it's a very big archive that's available to you guys. Uh, but the hotline jobs page, that's where new ads are posted each weekday. Um, we have anywhere like this time of year, September is a kind of a in-between month um, where like a lot of employers haven't kicked into gear yet for recruiting for 2024. Uh, some are and some are, you know, finishing up their summer seasons and, and stuff. So it's it's a quieter time of year. But as we move into October, November, December, and then especially in January, uh, we're going to see the numbers of new ads coming in definitely increase a lot. Um, as obviously there are more opportunities available in the summer months than there are in the winter months, just because there are more businesses open during the summer months, um, especially in the you know upper half of the lower 48. And um, sorry for the slowness here. Um, my website's running a little slow or our internet's not always the best here sometimes. 
but with the Hotline Jobs website page, you're able to uh, do a lot of different searching. So we provide consistency with our ad listings. Uh, we require the employers to include certain information with their ads. Uh, so that way you guys can much more easily narrow them down and search through them to find what you're looking for. So. Uh, with our hotline page, you can search for multiple states at one time if you want to. Uh, you can also search on if an RV site is going to be provided. Uh, if you are someone who doesn't have an RV or maybe you're traveling you know, with a tent or other uh, setup, but you would prefer to live at something else while you're working, uh, you can search for opportunities where housing is available. And uh, you can also search for all hours paid, other compensation might be like um, where uh, some hours you worked are paid, like we talked about before, you work so many hours for your site and then the rest of the hours are for pay. Um, so that would fall into other compensation or no monetary compensation. If you are someone you're like, I don't want reported income, I'm just looking to work and trade for an RV site to save on some money uh, for my camping costs, then you can look for opportunities where there is no monetary compensation. Most likely you're just working and trade for an RV site. Um, you can pick the month that you want to start in. If you, you know, you know, you want to start a job in November, check November or December um, immediately. If you're looking for something starting right away, you can search for those. And then if you are a solo, you can check this box to then just look at the listings that are for solos. And typically we see anywhere from 70 to 80 percent of the listings indicate that solos are considered. Uh, so it there really are a lot of opportunities for solos. Um, I think in other avenues if you're just looking at job listings it's more limited to uh, just campgrounds and rv parks and stuff and so i think solos who are just using those other resources end up seeing more ads that are couples only and think there aren't as many opportunities available for them um, but there, there really are a lot of opportunities out there so anyway you can do you know a bunch of different um, criteria inputs here to then um, get search results and look through um, the ads. We also put links to reviews right with the ad. Uh, so work campers who have previously worked for this employer and this one that we're looking at right here is uh, Seal Rock in Oregon. And they've had a work camper program for, I don't know, 20, 30 years at least. Uh, so you can click on view work camper experience postings and it will take you to the section where we can read uh, written reviews about this employer. And uh, it's pretty underutilized considering how many work campers are out there working. So uh, if you are an active work camper, we would love it if you would kind of work into your normal routine that once you finish a position, uh, you know, you ask that employer for your uh, letter of recommendation and then go in and be sure to write up uh, a review of what your experience was like working for that employer. So that way other work campers can read it and you know learn about what that experience was like from a fellow work camper's perspective. Whether it was a good experience, a bad experience, or, or something in between, um, you know, just sharing the details of what it was like for you will help others decide if that opportunity would be good for them or not. So um, we try to make it easy on you guys and kind of compile information in one place so you're not, okay, I found this job listing over here, but now I need to go over here to look for reviews and then go search over here and look over here and do all this stuff. So um, yes, you can find job listings and find a job anywhere, just cold call businesses in an area you wanna be in, you can totally do all of that. Uh, but we just have the tools in here to try to make it easier for you guys uh, to accomplish this process. All right, so uh, that kind of covers, you know, hours pay, how you can find opportunities that match the type of pay and, and stuff that you're looking for. So I uh, just kind of wanted to give you guys a short crash course on that. Um, all right, let's go back to our PowerPoint here. Okie dokie, and let's keep moving on. All right, uh, we had a couple of questions. Uh, about this topic so i kind of just combined it into one um, i have a insert description of rv here can i be a work camper so basically the question is what type of rv do you need to be a work camper do i need to have a specific type a specific length what if i have taken a van or a school bus or a box truck and modified it into something cool that i really love but it's not traditional or what if i'm in a tent or what if i'm just living in a car with a pop-out thing or whatever um, so you guys need to have whatever 
RV living setup that is best for you ultimately. What works for your budget, what you're physically capable of handling, what you like, um, you know, what you, I said that budget, what you can afford, etc. So uh, find the RV that's going to be best for you, whatever that means. And then you go about finding opportunities that will accept you for you and your home on wheels for what it is. Um, if you do have something that's a little more unique, it might be more difficult to find opportunities, um, especially if you are looking at maybe, you know, commercial campgrounds or a campground or RV park where the work campers are like lined up front and center and the product is the campground. So, in those instances, there might be some campground owners, operators who are a little more specific about what is on display in their operation and the impression that they're making with, you know, the, the workforce and the clientele that are in their park. So um, there might be, you know, some limitations you might not be accepted at certain places. But if you look outside of, you know, that commercial RV park campground realm, that provides a little more flexibility. Like um, at Bolin Travel Centers in uh, New Mexico and Arizona, they have employee RV sites set up at their travel centers. And it doesn't matter. They're not selling campsites, you know. So um, what RV you have makes much less of a difference um, for that situation. Um, and one thing too that employers have to factor in sometimes, um, especially if you're in like a remote location, uh, what facilities are there for their work campers? So um, if you are, you know, just living in a tent or maybe a, a converted van, SUV or something like that, and you don't necessarily have a shower, a bathroom, laundry, et cetera, if that's not readily available for you, then that may not be a good fit. Not every employer can offer bathhouses, shower houses, laundry on site, um, et cetera. And sometimes, depending upon the location of that employer, those types of facilities might be 30, 40, 100 miles away, you know, because some of these campgrounds and, and places are, can be pretty remote in national forests and, and things like that. So, um, weather is also a factor. You know, an employer would never want a work camper to come in and be, you know, melting in their RV or super, super cold or, you know, it rains for days and days and days and you just have to sit in your car, you know, and that you might be totally cool with that. And that's cool. But, you know, not everybody thinks that someone is going to be totally cool with that. So they want you to be comfortable no matter what the weather is. And some of it is also a safety factor. You know, if you're, you know, living in remote wilderness or even Yellowstone or whatever, there's going to be bears and stuff coming around. So no, you can't be a work camper in a tent in Yellowstone or, or in a pop-up um, just for the safety and, you know, food storage and, and things like that. So uh, there are going to be some limitations, uh, but like I said, <laughs> it's going to come down to, you know, the specific employer and their environment and operation and what they have to provide whether or not you're going to be a match for that. So uh, just be upfront about what your home on wheels is to make sure there are no surprises uh, because you want to make sure that, you know, however far you are going um, to get to that work camping job, like you don't want to waste your time and the miles and the costs you had to get there. Um, you know, no surprises. It would, would be most ideal. All right. Can a... Disabled individual be a work camper? Sure. There are many employers that are able to uh, make accommodations and, you know, the word disabled can mean a lot of different things. So uh, it's just knowing yourself and making sure that you are getting a lot of information about the opportunity that you are exploring. So that way you can best determine if this is going to work for you, you know, physically, mentally, or or whatever, um, or not. Uh, there are a lot of positions in the work camping realm that are, you know, more physical positions, but there are some where, you know, you're sitting behind a desk basically the entire day or answering a phone or whatever. So if you are someone who maybe um, has more like physical limitations or you are in a wheelchair or something, 
you're not likely going to want to run a Christmas tree sales lot or, um, you know, <laughs> something that's more physical. You're not going to be loading kayaks onto um, a vehicle to take, you know, a tour of kids and kayaks, you know, on the river or whatever. But you might do really well working in the office, answering the phone and making reservations for those kayak rentals or whatever. Um, even at places like amusement parks, you know, there are going to be a lot of positions where people are on their feet, helping people onto rides or running games or making food. But there are also opportunities where, you know, you're, you're seated in a kiosk, like maybe you can have a stool with you or, or something like that, um, where, you know, you're not having to move around as much or stand for long periods of time, etc. cetera. Um, and that's, you know, going to be more physical disability. Um, as far as, you know, any kind of mental disability goes, that's just going to be, like I said, getting an understanding of the position. If you're like, you know, I need to do something that is very systematized and just do the same thing over and over again because that's how I work best. You know, you need to find an opportunity that is that. That's not a opportunity where it's like, as a work camper working here, we're going to need you to step in and fill any role that may need to be filled at any time. You know, there are going to be opportunities that are like that where they may want you to do, you know, you're hired to do this, but oh, something came up. Now we need you to do this or this or this or this. So if you're like, I can only do this, then don't go with an opportunity where you may end up needing to multitask and do something that you're not physically capable of. Um, so and, you know, uh, employers can't like come out and ask questions uh, specifically about that because it trends to discrimination and, and things like that. So um, it's kind of up to you guys to come up with questions to feel out that employer, like I said, to get a good understanding of what the opportunity is, the expectations of that opportunity and the duties, things like that. Um, so you can then go, yes, this sounds like it could work for me or no, it can't. And different employers will, you know, have different capabilities. If you're like, you know, hey, I am in a wheelchair, but I'd really be good at doing X, you know, they may be able to make some accommodations to, you know, um, make it work so you can, you know, physically do that job, et cetera. So uh, it's just going to take some feeling out, um, but we've we've definitely seen a lot of work campers um, in the community that have some kind of disability. Okay, uh, next up here, how do I get my first few jobs with no previous work camper jobs on your resume? Uh, just highlight the skills that you do have. Uh, typically, you know, whether it was a career position or just your life in general, you have acquired skills that could apply to a lot of these positions. Most work camping positions and more you know, entry level, not rocket science uh, kind of things. And employers are often, you know, very happy to train you. And also not every employer will do things the same way. So um, yes, you may work, you know, um, housekeeping at a campground, resort, hotel or whatever, but housekeeping at one resort means something different than housekeeping at another resort. So uh, you want to make sure to clarify and also, you know, be specific in your resume too. So uh, think about what you've done in your career. Well, first, look at the different jobs that are out there. Think about the types of jobs that you're interested in doing and then go, okay, I'm interested in doing this type of job. What kind of skills do I think I need to do that kind of job? What have I done in my life that may have given me some skills that would match with that. So uh, when you're working on your resume, you want to, you know, kind of succinctly say what you bring to the table. Uh, you want to answer the question, the employer is going to be asking what's in it for me when they're looking at this resume and you want to make sure to answer that as best as possible. What do you bring to the table? Um, don't fill your resume with, I want to do this and I, you know, seek to bring blah, 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 and have all this flowery stuff. And, you know, um, you want to, again, you need to make it more, it, like make it about yourself, but also like make it about the employer. Um, anyway, we have a lot of articles and videos and stuff that you can go through to kind of help you with the more specific language. Uh, but really the nitty gritty of it is just highlighting those skills that apply. And um, like I said, even in your home life, you know, if you uh, took care of a house and you did light electrical and painting and yard work every weekend and stuff, you know, like I, I can mow lawns at a campground. I can run a weed eater, you know, if it breaks, I might need some help figuring out how to fix it. But, 
you know, um, that I could do that kind of thing and I would be physically capable of it and, and happy to do it, you know. So uh, if you um, maybe you were like a treasurer for your local book club or your church or something, then you have some money handling skills. Uh, if you were like a coach uh, for your kids' team or something like that, then you have some leadership skills, some organizational skills. Uh, so there's likely a lot of things you've done in your life, you know, that give you the capabilities uh, to do this. But most often employers are looking for work campers who have a positive attitude, who are willing to jump in and give their best effort, uh, you know, willing to listen and learn, not try to tell the employer how to run their business um, and do things. I mean, some are open to suggestions, of course, but, you know, you don't want to just come in guns a blazing telling the employer how they should be doing things. Um, okay, also, sorry, rabbit trail. My brain goes, whoo, 20 different ways every every second. Okay, so um, yes, positive attitude, willing to learn, and just um, commitment, being able to commit. And uh, don't oversell yourself. Don't say you can do things that you can't if you're like, oh, I'm great with a computer, where all you really know how to do is check your email. And like, they sit you down and they're like, okay, work this campground reservation software. And you're like, what? How do I do that? So anyway, um, if you're not, you know, if, if all you do is check emails on a computer, I wouldn't consider that comfortable with computers. Um, so, you know, things like that. Don't oversell yourself. Uh, under, understand what your capabilities are. But if you're like, yeah, I've used a computer enough. If you show me how to do it, I'll be able to do it. You know, I can I can click the things and move around and, and think quickly about it. Then cool, you know. And a lot of that stuff too is, is going to come out more in the interview as well. Um, the resume is really just kind of a snapshot first impression. So um, don't use your newness as like a, a crutch or a sell yourself short kind of thing. You know, um, don't make your attitude, well, I know I haven't worked camp before, so I may not be right and I may not be good enough. And it, no, no, that is not the right attitude to take, okay? Um, you know, just be like, this is me. This is what I think I can do for you. What do you think? Let's learn more about each other and see if this is going to be a fit. You know, I'm new to this work camping thing, but I'm excited to try and dig in and learn and be a part of your team. You know, um, so so go go into it with a head held high attitude, not a sorry, I'm new. Please consider me kind of attitude. OK, um, so yeah. So rah, rah, feel good about yourself. OK. Um, this one, this person says, how do I make my resume stand out? Uh, so let's talk about that first. And um, we kind of, you know, have started talking about resumes a little bit here, but uh, let's dive in a little bit more. Um, again, I'm going to go to uh, the workcamper.com website here. We do have a resume builder tool and I do have that open already. So this is one tool you can use uh, to create a resume geared towards work camping. Uh, if you want to just type something up on your computer or whatever, that's cool too. When you um, create a resume and have it available in our database, it can be found by employers. Uh, the only employers that have access to our database are our paid employer members. It's not open to the entire internet. We're not posting um, all of your stuff for anyone in the world to find. Uh, I just caution you guys, there are other sites out there where, you know, people are sharing their information and stuff. So just be a little cautious about that. There are spammers and pirates everywhere, unfortunately. Uh, but here with our database, like I mentioned before, we have some employers that never advertise jobs. All they do is go into our resume database and do a bunch of searches and reach out to work campers and make that contact and do their recruiting that way. So when you have your resume in our system, you are opening yourself up to more opportunities. Um, and with this builder, it's easy. You just go step by step, fill out the fields, save each page, and then you know away, away you go. Um, we take all of the information from each section and compile it into a nicer view. Um, so you can see we've got um, our names at the top, I've put three photos here on my resume. I've made a little introductory video from my YouTube channel that I have embedded on my resume. Um, I've got some text information here, again, highlighting those skills in an easy to read way. 
And then here's the rest of the information from the different sections. It just compiles it and puts it in a nice format. Um, and I have my work history here in an easy chronological way for employers to see. Uh, so that's, you know, uh, the resume builder. It's, it's pretty easy to use um, in the sell yourself section where you can type up whatever you want. There is a sample that you're welcome to model off of. And uh, photos are optional, up to you guys if you want to put them in or not. Video is optional as well, of course. Uh, but the video is one thing you can use to kind of uh, stand out. And uh, that's just recording a little video, be like, hey, we're so and so, and uh, we're super great because of blah, blah, blah. We think we'd be a super fit because we really enjoy blah, blah, blah. And um, our skills that are do, 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 do will, you know, make your business that much better. So, Please take a look at our resume and contact us for more information you know kind of thing so um, having that little video where they're seeing you talk seeing you move um, gives them a, a nice introduction to you more than just text on a page um, you of course can do all of that just via email if you want to send an email to an employer <clears throat> you know put some text in there put a link into a video that you've put on your youtube or whatever you know and just send them an email if you want and have all of that in an email instead of using like our builder tool. Also, uh, something else that we have with our tool. So um, I mentioned before, you guys, we have three different membership levels and our upper level, our platinum level membership is really best for those who have more than one work camping job completed in the last few years. So with platinum level members, when you guys put in a work history entry um, into your resume here, then you can check the box and request to have us verify it for you. So we will contact you know, XYZ employer, uh, give them a call and say, hey, did Jane Doe work for you from this start date to this end date? And they'll say yes or no. Um, if they say yes, then we will mark that work history as verified. And so when an employer is in our database, um, they can search to only view resumes that have verified work history. Uh, this is just taking away a little bit of work from the employer. Uh, we have already, you know, a third party has already verified for them that this work camper has worked, you know, these jobs um, in their history. So uh, that you know, can kind of put a bit of a shining star, you know, on the top of your resume. Uh, the employers will see that when viewing your resume in the database, or you can mention it to them when communicating with them, um, et cetera, that you have verified work history, verified by us, not, you know, verified by the work camper. So it just gives a little more uh, validation to it. So uh, that's one way to kind of stand out with your resume. Um, yeah. Uh, also, uh, if we go to our article index, we'll pop in here real quick, um, and I'll just show you guys a few of the articles. Uh, like I mentioned, we have quite a few articles about uh, resumes. So if we go into job finding tools, uh, we have some questions in here as well, questions to ask work camper employers, like during the interview process and stuff. Uh, empowering your resume, four tips for your resume, spruce up your resume, Sandy's mom's resume, 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 resume. Uh, so definitely go through those different articles. That's going to give you different tips and tricks and, and things like that to help you with like the content part. But, um, you know, just making a good first impression, uh, follow through with the instructions that the employer has in their ad. If they say, you know, email resume to blah, 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 don't just call. Um, if the instructions are to email your resume, because uh, some employers are, are using uh, that, you know, the contact or the application process as a tool to weed out applicants. Well, they can't follow instructions from my ad, so they're in the no pile kind of thing. So uh, try to best follow instructions in the ad, starting out um, with your initial communications. Um, um, just trying to think off the top of my head of anything else to stand out. Uh, just, just being clear and concise. Oh, uh, something else I was going to think of too. Have somebody read your resume. So once you've created your resume, whether it's in our builder or on your computer or phone or whatever, um, see if a few of your friends or family members or whatever would read your resume. Uh, 
and give their feedback and input. You know, they're going to find, you know, maybe some typos or like, hey, like this was kind of worded funny. I didn't know what this meant. You know, just having some different perspectives and other eyes looking at your resume for you um, will likely give you some good feedback to kind of help you improve things. And, you know, especially if it is, you know, friends or family, people that do know you, they may be like, well, hey, I don't you remember you did this thingamajig, blah, 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 back in whatever. And, you know, I think that would be something that'd be good for your resume. Or, you know, you're actually really good at, because people see us differently than we see ourselves. So uh, sometimes getting feedback from, you know, your circle can uh, help you out as well with um, expanding on your resume. So, okay. Uh, hopefully that's some good input to get you started there. Uh, the other question is that this person had, uh, how do you deal with no response when sending out resumes. Um, and that's just part of the game. So for all eternity, since we've been in business, four campers have said, employers never get back to me when I contact them. And then we hear from employers that say, work campers never get back to us when we contact them, or work campers don't update their resumes after they take jobs. So this is just a thing with people that happens. Um, yes, it would be great if every employer was professional enough to respond to every inquiry. That would be ideal, but that's just not what happens. Um, also, make sure you sent your communication, especially if this is email, mostly email specifically, um, make sure you sent it to the right email address because uh, with our resume builder tool, you guys can email your resume right from the resume builder itself and then it tracks for you when your resume was sent into who and um, we can always go and look up those emails that you've sent to to see if it's been opened or not um, it's not a totally 100 percent foolproof system because some domains don't share open rates and things like that not open rates but open anyways um so yeah um and with that i see a lot of incorrect email addresses that resumes are being sent to just little typos or sometimes someone will send their resume to www.campingresort at gmail.com it's like that's that's not an email address so you know just goofy stuff like that happens sometimes we're all human we all make mistakes so double check the email address that you sent it to because it might have been the wrong email address accidentally uh, so that's one thing. And, you know, email is not reliable. Um, your email could have been blocked. It could have gone to their spam. It could be more than one person is checking that email account and whoever was checking it just kind of accidentally or willy nilly deleted stuff. And one of those happened to be your inquiry. So you never know, you know, weird stuff like that can happen too. So email especially can be challenging as far as a communication uh, method. So we just recommend following up. Um, if you are applying for an opportunity, like, you know, maybe right now you're already working on your summer 2024, lining up a position for then. So it's like, you know, six, eight months down the road. So you make an inquiry with an employer, you might give them, you know, a few weeks or a month to get back to you just because you know it's, it's kind of far out. And some of those employers are still finishing up their summer season now, so they don't have a lot of time on their hands to be working on, you know, they're wanting to get applications for next year, but they're not ready to deal with it yet kind of thing. Um, so sometimes you can give employers some grace and, and a little bit more time. Um, if it is an opportunity that is starting like immediately or next month, then I would wait a day, maybe a couple days at the most uh, to be following up and um, you know, ensuring, hey, did you get my email? Or um, I called and left a voicemail yesterday, but hadn't heard back, so I'm sending an email now just to see if you, you know you're able to get back to me soon. Uh, so um, if an ad, like if you're contacting that employer because they advertise, uh, look look at what the ad says. I know we kind of talked about that already. If the employer gave multiple points of contact, then I would use multiple points of contact to communicate with that employer. Uh, if that employer included just like their website address in their ad, then I would say that's free game to use whatever contact info is on their website. They may have a contact form, they may have a phone number, they may have an email address, they may have a Facebook page, et cetera. Um, I would be you know, utilizing maybe one or more different uh, portals to try to communicate with that employer, especially if that position is starting, you know, much sooner than later. Um, so 
yeah, if um, it's up to you, if, if you think it's an opportunity that's really like, this seems like it's for me and that employer is just not getting back to you, then, you know, use whatever you can with the internet. Now we have a million different ways to research and try to communicate, you know, with a business and um, sometimes it goes well and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so yeah, uh, you could even uh, go with snail mail. Uh, if it is an opportunity that's a few months out, uh, you could send them something in the mail. That would be pretty unique. And I'm sure not many work campers are doing that anymore. You know, maybe you have a little printout with your headshot and a little spiel, um, you know, like, hey, we communicated with you about your work camping opportunities. Really looking forward to speaking more. You know, here's a little more about us call us anytime, blah, 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 um, and send them a physical mail piece, you know? So uh, there's there's multiple different ways, multiple different tax to, tactics to take. Um, and it just kind of depends on how soon the opportunity is starting and how much you want that job and, and whatnot. Uh, some work campers will say, you know, if an employer doesn't communicate back with me, then that's that means that wasn't the right opportunity for me, or that means those employers must be terrible communicators and terrible business owners, so I don't wanna go work for them. You know, and it, that could be true, you don't know. Um, you know, so it, it's kind of up to you how you wanna feel about it and, and what, you know, how much effort you do want to put in uh, to following up with those employers, but uh, we recommend at least trying, especially if your only communication is via email, cause that's gonna be probably the most unreliable. Um, and, it, and it gets hard to, especially if you're communicating with a bigger entity and maybe they are using like a third party service that's get, that's an online application process. So it's like you're not even on that company's website, but you're submitting an online application. And so you're like, I got nothing. <laughs> All I have is this someone else's website that the employer's paying to use for an application process, you know, and then you're just like, Ugh. So um, that's when it, it can be a little harder to get creative and, you know, find corporate and try to find some contact information, et cetera. Um, you might go back and look um, and see if they've had ads in the past uh, that may have different contact information. Uh, that's one thing you could always try to. So yeah, all right, hopefully that gives you a little bit of input there on that question. Okay, uh, this one's an easy one. Where or who do I send my resume to? Uh, wherever the employer tells you to. Uh, so if they want it emailed, they'll usually give an email address. If they have an online application process, typically they'll give you the link to the online application process or their website, which lists their jobs, and then you click on the specific job to then you know get more information or apply, et cetera. So um, you need to communicate with the employer however they have told you to communicate with them. Um, if you're, you know, cold calling a business, if you're, you know, literally calling them or just emailing them out of the blue, um, you're going to use whatever contact information you found on their website or Facebook page or Google account or, or whatever. Okay, uh, next up here, how to find nonprofit organizations working with rescue animals like horses, livestock, dog, livestock dogs, cats. Um, so we have a page at workcamper.com. Um, it's not heavily utilized, uh, but there are you know, multiple opportunities published here throughout the year. Uh, here it is. Um, so this is under work camping job resources, and it is the volunteer section. I didn't mean to click on that, volunteer opportunities. Now it's gonna open my page again, okay. Uh, so this page, anyone can get to on our website at any time. You don't have to be logged in. And uh, nonprofit organizations can run volunteer ads here. Um, at the moment, there are no like animal rescues. We have had animal rescues before um, advertised here on this page. Uh, but it's possible, I didn't like Google it, but I'm sure there are like websites that list nonprofits that have to do with, you know, um, animals, animal rescues and stuff. So uh, just Googling to find those um, around. Uh, I think there might be some, like I know Safe Harbor Farm uh, has been recruiting work campers for a long time. And Lynn, she's done our podcast a couple times here uh, just cause they kind of, you know, updates things at their property. So uh, Safe Harbor Farm is one uh, that, has a work camper program. Um, 
I don't remember if we have any others in the podcast, but um, you could also go back like in issues of our magazine, pull up a PDF issue, do a keyword search for nonprofit, uh, go to our hotline jobs page, search for nonprofit. Uh, you're less likely to find them advertising though, because um, they don't often have a budget for that. But um, so yeah, there are a few around that know of work campers and hire work campers already. Um, so our volunteer page would be would be best for that. And let's go to part two of this person's question. Um, how to talk to places that have never had work campers previously that seem to be a good fit for them and work campers. Um, so yeah, it's it's just letting them know, you know, who work campers are, that your individuals living in RVs seeking to work, uh, typically in trade for an RV site and hookups as part or all of your compensation. And uh, just explaining kind of what your general needs are and you're welcome to send them to workcamper.com. We have a wealth of information for employers. Uh, we similarly have, you know, a bunch of articles on our website. We do a bi-monthly newsletter for our employers, giving them more information. Um, and we have, you know, recruiting avenues as well. Um, so, yeah, just letting them know who we're campers are. That's that's how, you know, a lot of employers got introduced to work campers because of work campers. So um, we certainly appreciate you guys sharing about who you are and what you're doing in this lifestyle you're living uh, because you're you're opening the door to more opportunities for fellow work campers. Um, so yeah, there are some, you know, maybe tax ramifications and things about offering an RV site, whether they can, whether they have to include it as income or not. Um, with bartering in different different states have different rules on bartering uh, federally. Uh, there's an IRS guideline um, working for um, if the housing is provided by the employer and it is um, a contingency, like the if it's required that the employee accepts the employer housing, then like it doesn't have to be considered income to the employee and stuff. So, um, you know, we have the specific wording in the IRS and, and that kind of stuff on our website for employers. So we can kind of help them with getting started or knowing what questions to ask, you know, their accountants or their lawyers or whatever um, to to better than determine if that will work for their business operation and stuff. So, um, yeah. Lots of free information on our website too. Our employer FAQ has some really good stuff. Okay, uh, next up here, are there short-term jobs? Uh, yes, there are short-term jobs, but I mean, it short-term could mean a variety of different things. So um, the shortest position I've seen advertised, I think was about four days. Uh, there are a few, you know, festivals and like events that recruit work campers that would be maybe a weekend or a week. Uh, we talked a little bit about the sugar beet harvest that on the short end could be about two weeks, but typically more like a month. Um, so, yeah, there are definitely some shorter ones out there. Uh, often, especially if you are looking at a business that is seasonal, like their operation, like they literally are only open May to October, uh, those types of entities are more often going to want to hire their staff and just have their staff to plow through and get through the season um, and not have to continuously be bringing in new people and training and, and all that stuff. Uh, or if it's a business that's open year round, they may have a little more flexibility uh, in that. It's going to depend on kind of their busy times, if they have busy times or if it's a consistent flow. Um, but yeah, short term jobs. I know I've said it like three times already, but I guess it's just the time of year. But the pumpkin lots and the Christmas trees, that's obviously a shorter term job. Um, uh, DigiKey is a electronics fulfillment center up in Minnesota. Express Employment Professionals hires work campers for them. That can be as short as three months. Uh, so there are, you know, many opportunities that are three months, uh, but often you're going to be more like six months. And that might be short term for some. Uh, there are longer term opportunities out there. If you want to be somewhere year round or multiple years, there are certainly employers that would love that too. Um, other short term things like uh, you could do uh, sales positions like working with Southeast Publications or AGS where you are going around to different areas and uh, you go to a campground and you then work to sell ads and media 
uh, of local businesses in that area around that campground that then go, you know, on that campground map or on that campground's website or whatever. Um, and that's a sales position. So your hours and the length of time it takes you is going to vary. There is an entity called ID plans that hire work campers to um, kind of like build out the schematics of large buildings like uh, shopping malls. Um, so that is going to be, you know, a few days work and then a few days compiling all of the data and stuff into the system. Uh, you could operate your own business on the road. So maybe you want to become a mobile RV tech or you're a crafter and you want to sell stuff at fairs and shows and things, you know, those would be shorter term stints. You could work when you wanted to work. So yeah, uh, lots of variety that are out there. Um, if you're looking for more like gig work, like you want to be somewhere for one week and then move another week and then move another week, um, I think there are like apps for that where if you want to like be getting groceries for people or doing like the DoorDash food delivery or like Ubering in different places or something, um, I'm not as familiar with how all of those systems work as far as working for them, uh, but there are other apps and websites for those kinds of things because that's not specific to our viewers. That's just specific to any human wanting to do short work or some work on the side of their normal nine to five job or whatnot. Uh, let's see, uh, this person's other question was, are there laundry facilities at most places? Um, I, I can't say, we can't say. Um, employers write basically whatever they want in their ad text. You know, um, I showed you guys, we get information about RV site compensation, job start date, solos, et cetera. Um, on the new version of our website that we're actually working on now behind the scenes that should launch in the next few months, uh, we're gonna have a few more items um, that the employer has to include. Uh, laundry facilities isn't one of them. Um, so I, I can't give you like a percentage on that. And it, it's going to vary, you know, um, if you are going to like, like if you're working the sugar beet harvest, the sugar beet harvest team finds local campgrounds, hotels, motels, apartment buildings, et cetera, that they then rent to put their work campers in. So if you are working for the sugar beet harvest, if you're living, you know, if they put you in XYZ campground, there might be laundry facilities. But if they put you in ABC campground, that one doesn't have laundry facilities, you know. So even going to work for the same employer, you may not have the exact same facilities that other work campers would have. So it's really hard to say yes or no to this question. So sorry. All right, next up here. Uh, we are new to this. We were invited to stay at a friend's 60 acre horse farm with 20 sites for primitive camping. We offered to work camp instead of boondocking so we can start with a good reference. We decided to do a contract to make it official and help <laughs> was the question there. Um, so yeah, we recommend uh, no matter who you're going to work for, uh, we recommend getting a work agreement. And a work agreement just lays out um, the expectations and kind of, yeah, the expectations of both parties is really the simplest way to uh, describe that. It's not exactly a contract. Um, I don't know of any employers that have been sued by work campers or vice versa. Like that's not really a thing that occurs. I don't know that, you know, a work agreement would like hold up in court or whatnot. Uh, we, sh we just haven't heard about any of that happening in the past. Um, you can use it like if you need to file a claim with the Department of Labor for whatever reason, uh, that would be some evidence to assist you with that kind of claim. Uh, but yeah, a work agreement kind of, you know, it just spells out the details, start and end dates, agreed compensation, agreed duties. Um, I would try to get any specifics in there if you were like um, agreeing to work for a period of time. But in that time, you know that, you know, your best friend's getting married, so you're going to need to leave for a week to go to his wedding and then come back. So in that agreement, I would want to be like, employer agrees that Jane Doe will be off this date to this date for a, a function, you know, or vacation or whatever. Um, if you uh, are communicating with the employer and it's, you know, you agree to something unique where like uh, most work campers would need to pay the electricity cost for their RV site, but because of what you bring to the table or what you're going to be doing, the employer is agreeing that the employer will cover the cost of your electric, 
that would be something to go in the work agreement because it is different from what was you know advertised or told originally um so yeah just kind of some specifics like that um also in this person's case specifically since they are working on a uh, person's horse farm property um i would want to um is that an actual business like is this farm just owned by you know john and sally and it's their personal property um, or is it an actual business entity that is operating on that property? What kind of insurance is available? Um, are you, if you are going to be an employee, um, then you know what workers' comp is available? Are they paying unemployment? You know their share of unemployment because you're an employee there. You know just making sure that they are acting properly as what appears to be business owners. Um, if it is a horse farm, I assume that is some sort of business and, or they're offering primitive camping, you know. Um, so they should have, you know, insurances and those things covering themselves and would cover anyone, you know, issues with campers or workers that would be on site. They should have those kinds of things in place. So um, I would definitely want to be asking questions about that. Because um, yes, you might be friends, but you know, bad things can happen and maybe your friend acts differently than you think they should and they become not your friend anymore and that would be awful um but you know you want to be prepared and know that you would be taken care of in those in those kind of situations and not ju don't just assume it you know no hey they have an insurance policy in place that would cover me if i got hurt on the job or something like that so so yeah, um, so work agreement, we do have a sample here. Um, if you go, like I said, work camping, job resources, um, it's here, sample work agreement. It's also on the left here, sample work agreement. So this is just a, a quick uh, example that you can look at. Uh, we also have um, in our media library, work camping media library, this is for our logged in uh, members. If we scroll down, these are all videos, you guys, that we have in here. Lots of videos. Okay, uh, working for training, and I am looking for all about work agreements. So this is like an hour, hour and a half video where we go over all of the details about work agreements, how to ask for one, what should be included, etc. Uh, so definitely uh, listen to that video, and you'll get a lot more uh, details on that as well. All right, let's go back to our PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay. This question is, how can I get a remote job to live traveling the country? Uh, I would recommend going to the websites that list remote jobs and applying for the ones that look most interesting and exciting to you. Uh, so companies that offer remote jobs, it doesn't matter that their workers are living in an RV or a house or an apartment or whatever. So um, those types of entities don't really advertise to the work camping community because they just want to advertise to the largest amount of people possible. So they're going to use those big websites like Indeed and remotework.com or, you know, whatever. The, like if you just go to Google and search remote work jobs, like that's going to give you the websites that have the most remote work job listings. Um, so whatever avenue that you were looking at work camping job listings, you're not likely to find a lot of work from home jobs. And if you are, you know, in a Facebook group or one of those free websites that are out there and you see like a remote job opportunity, uh, make sure to really vet it thoroughly, uh, you know, cause any spammer, bot or pirate can go post on Facebook or go submit a form on a free website kind of thing. So um, just be more cautious about those and make sure it's on the up and up. You know, if you start getting messages where they want you to text them your credit card number and your social security number and your driver's license number and that kind of thing, oh no, 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 that is, that's not okay um, kind of thing. So um, yeah, so just be extra cautious when seeing those, you know, work from home, make tons of money uh, kind of jobs. Um, you know, on on the internet out there, uh, just look at that. Or if if you're using a website, you know, like Indeed, I think the websites where employers have to invest in you know running ads and stuff like that, um, it's going to be a little more trustworthy just because that paywall helps. Um, there are still uh, pirates that will do it. They steal other people's credit cards, go onto those websites, and run ads. Um, 
I assume that because they try to do it on our website and all of our ads we look at ahead of time and typically you can sniff it out. And so those types of ads that have been attempted into our system, we um, got them shut down before they got access to anybody. So anyway, so just be cautious with uh, researching those opportunities, Re research them really well. So sorry, you won't see a lot of remote opportunities. We have a couple that have come through um, the Work Camper News system here and there, but they were businesses in the RV like community industry itself. And so they actually were looking for, you know, folks, you know, um, specific to the RV lifestyle to work as like customer service reps or whatever. Um, one was a website that listed RVs for sale. Uh, another was like CoachNet for a while. They were looking for like phone customer service people. Um, and there have been a, a couple others, but it doesn't happen a lot. Uh, if they do come through our system, it will be in the uh, state section that's called multiple locations. Um, if you're watching this video later and the new version of WorkCamper.com is already launched, we do have uh, remote as an option to search on um, in the job listings. But like I said, it's it's just it's not going to be a whole lot. OK, uh, next up here, we're getting close, guys. Just a couple more questions to go. Uh, we're moving into our more RV lifestyle questions now, kind of out of the work camping questions. OK. This person uh, has a plan to start a new chapter as a solo a year from now. Um, this person is going to purchase a truck and travel trailer. The travel trailer they are looking at is a Nash FM18, uh, gross vehicle weight rate of 7,500. Wondering about resource as to options for a truck. Uh, feedback is welcome. Okay, so uh, let's pop back over. And it's funny you answered this question or asked this question because we've been through this um, ourselves. So um, I I pulled up a bunch of different sites here. I'm not really sure where to start. Um, anyway, so okay, just from my own perspective, and let me just I'm gonna pop back over here so you guys aren't just reading that other website page. So we, uh, my husband and I, have been RVers for about 10 years now. Um, we have traveled in a class A, we have owned and lived full time in a fifth wheel, uh, we part timed in a class C, and now we are down to a travel trailer. And with our travel trailer, we are now on our third truck. Um, we started with a small GMC Canyon, which we actually bought thinking we were going to tow it behind our motorhome, but then we sold our motorhome. Um, so then we went to work to find a trailer we could tow with our very small truck. Uh, the GMC Canyon is like a Ford Ranger. It's like the little guys. I forget. I'm I'm sorry. I don't know the like truck lingo super well. So if I say things not quite right, like I'm sorry, but just just bear with me. So anyway, so we have the GMC Canyon. The travel trailer that we ended up getting is about the same as what you're looking to get. It's I think the the gross vehicle weight rate is like is like 7,400. So our GMC Canyon could tow about 9,000. And there's also like you have to factor in um, the towing capacity and also your payload or your cargo capacity because uh, all of that kind of factors in. So uh, we had the Canyon for a while. We towed with it a little bit on a few trips, uh, but it it wasn't awesome. It it did it. And granted, we live in Arkansas and where we went with it was like Alabama and stuff. So we never tried to take it on any real mountain roads and stuff. So I imagine going out west, it would have been not great because um, you really you want more truck than you need typically. Uh, and that's also that's just kind of for safety. Um, you know, you don't want to feel scared driving down the road or feel uncomfortable driving down the road. And also stopping power is a factor. With our little truck and that trailer, yeah, it did the job, but in some scenarios, it probably wouldn't have been enough, you know, kind of thing. And some RVers out there will tell you like a rule of thumb is um, like at 80%, you want to be up to 80% of the capacity that's listed on your truck and not go over 80% just to give yourself some wiggle room. That's up to you if you want to follow that rule of thumb or not. Some just prefer to do that. Um, but so we had the little truck. Then we moved to an F-150 because we thought, oh, that'll be much better for towing. You know, it's a slightly bigger truck. And we just wanted more cab space as well. Um, so that, that was a nicer experience. Uh, but also one thing that you have to keep in mind 
is um, every truck is going to be different based on what's on the truck. So even if you're looking at, you know, Ford F-150s or Ram, whatever, whatever's, you can look up like the general, you know, towing capacity, payload and stuff like that. But the actual of the vehicle that you want to get, that's going to be on the sticker on the vehicle. And that may be different from what, you know, the website for Ram trucks says it is. And what factors into that oftentimes is the trim packages and the stuff. So if you get a truck that has the sunroof and the heated and cooled seats and the massage things, and then you also, you add a winch and a reinforced bumper and a lift kit and a extra fuel tank and like, those kind of things that some folks like to have and add to their trucks, all of that adds weight to your truck and thus comes off of your capability for your payload or your cargo carrying capability. So um, that's some things to keep in mind. And uh, specifically like the F-150 truck that we bought, it was like lifted a little bit and had bigger tires. And that changed the towing experience because of that. I think it was not as nice because of that. It looked really cool, but it made the towing experience not so good. And so now we have, um, we decided to move up to a Ford F-350, uh, just a gas, not a dually. And that greatly increased our um, towing capabilities. And it's going to be a lot smoother of a ride. Uh, with the F-150 and especially with the Canyon, there was just, like you could tell the trailer was there and the truck just kind of moved and kind of it didn't like bounce but just kind of moved a little bit so anyway with the f-350 we're not going to encounter that and when we had the fifth wheel trailer we had the f-350 with the dually tires diesel so we were well covered as far as uh, towing capabilities at that point and then your hitch uh, can also factor in so uh, we went with a weight distribution hitch, uh, the Anderson weight distribution hitch is the one that we got because we wanted to be able to, you know, if you put your trailer on your truck and like it's sagging and stuff, you, you know, you need to be able to make some adjustments so it's not, you want to try to be like as level as you possibly can uh, when you're towing. So uh, the weight distribution hitch gives us a little more flexibility to adjust where the weight is at and also helps with the sway prevention and whatnot. So um, Anderson hitch is a good one for that. Also um, B&W, uh, this is the page for that. Um, they now have a weight distribution hitch, which B&W is awesome. If you can ever, it's all USA made. If you can ever go to their factory in Kansas and have a tour, like it's amazing. And they make really good quality stuff. We've had uh, multiple of their hitches and stuff. So I definitely recommend looking into them as far as a weight distribution hitch. And I have remembered that they had something on their website uh, that was about and I, I Googled this, but here's the website, bwtrailerhitches.com slash towing help bumper uh, with some hyphens in there, towing hyphen help bumper. And so in here, you know, you can enter some stats. Like this is kind of if you are looking at a specific truck, you might be able to get, you know, some information then about the different types of trucks that are out there. And it appears there are a few of these websites. Um, I found one on Camping World as well. What is the towing capacity of my vehicle? Um, so this is kind of a, a similar thing. Oh, it wants you to pick a year before it lets you pick a make. So, but that's kind of harder because that's like, well, I don't, I don't know yet what kind of truck I, I want to know what truck to get before I, you know, start doing these searches and stuff. Um, so honestly, I just did how to pick a truck for towing a trailer. Um, and, you know, multiple articles came up. This to-go RV one looked like a pretty good article. Um, it had a lot of information and there was a little like, and there's fifth wheel, best trucks for towing. And this is 2020, so <clears throat> it's a little bit outdated. Um, and I think to towing capacities, at least on the Ford trucks, sorry, we're Ford people, um, but, um, the towing capacity has definitely increased for a lot of the trucks out there. So yeah, I would just Google, read some articles. If you can narrow down to maybe a couple trucks that you're interested in, uh, if you are in any Facebook groups, if you're on Facebook, there are groups like 
Um, I'm in one that's like Travel Trailer Life or something. There's a lot of different groups for our viewers. And you can always pose questions in there. Um, you know, you're gonna get a lot of different input. Some of it might actually be like factual. Some of it might not be. Uh, some of it will be helpful. Some of it won't be. But there are, <laughs> there's definitely the, what they call the towing police um, in the RV community and people who love to evaluate, okay, well, give me all of the stats and I'll tell you if you're overweight or not, you know, kind of thing. So, um, yeah, so it, it's going to take some research for sure. And, you know, it also comes back to what's your budget? What are you comfortable with handling? What do you like the looks of, et cetera? Maybe what's available in your local area if you don't want to buy something that's further away. Uh, so that's that's all that you know could factor into your decision making too. But uh, you definitely want to make sure that you, um, if you're considering a specific truck that's you know on a dealer lot or someone selling or whatever, um, definitely find that sticker. Uh, that gives you the towing capacity and the payload, et cetera, for that actual truck, um, because it could vary depending upon the different options and things that are on the truck. So, um, yeah, those general tow rating, or the ratings, you know, for just you know, RAM, whatever's in general, may not be exact for the, the actual truck that you're considering buying. So uh, be sure to, to check that sticker and uh, ask if you're, you know, shopping, and looking at trucks that are you can't just go see yourself have the salesman take a picture and, and send it to you um, or if you can if it works in your budget um, find an inspector to go and look the truck over for you and take pictures and look at all the systems and stuff like that and get that report back before consider buying it um, we we did that once we actually we found an rv inspector who used to be an auto mechanic so he would do auto inspections and rv inspections uh, for people who were considering buying them and uh, so he went and checked out a truck for us that we ultimately ended up not buying because of what was in the report we weren't comfortable with so anyway uh, definitely lots of different websites that are out there um, like i said i just did some googling and, and found some articles um, you, I'm sure there are videos on YouTube as well and stuff, but kind of knowing your source, like to go RV, I've seen online a lot, um, and, the, and they offer quite a few things. Uh, but if it's just some, you know, Joe Schmo blog or, you know, somebody's made a YouTube channel and they're like, I make videos about RVs, but they've never like actually like had one or they're like, we're going RV next year. So let me tell you what you should do. And it's like, you do you, but how do you like do how are you qualified for that you know kind of thing so know your source as well um when researching some of this stuff whether it's figuring out you know towing uh setups or or anything um just just know your source so uh yeah lots of different articles so hopefully this gives you you know a place to start um and you can find the right truck for you but it, it's it's a process and um you may not get it right the first time and uh there are a lot of trucks out there though so hopefully you know you can get it figured out okay last question here that was submitted ahead of time um wi-fi hot boxes for time working in parks without internet which one will use whichever provider that has strongest signal <laughs> our provider service is horrible here with cell phones it is hit or miss depending upon depending on area someone in thank you uh so I would recommend, oops, I didn't mean to do that, guys. Uh, shoot. I done messed it all up. Okay, let me get back. Sorry, guys, I messed up my screen and now I'm totally thrown off. Okay, it's because I stopped sharing anything. Okay, back to Google. I wanted to show you guys this website, uh, rvmobileinternet.com. This is going to be the best place to learn about the different types of connection options, types of gear, data, et cetera. Uh, these folks have tried out pretty much everything that's out there and they you know, outline their experience and what's available and whatnot. So um, you can go through their overview, you can look at the different gear that's out there. Um, if you are in an area and you're staying in that area, but the cell service is bad, then I guess satellite is going to be, you know, the next best um, option for you. Uh, if you're going to be moving around more, then a cellular plan might work okay for you. 
uh, personally, we have AT&T and uh, we honestly just use phones as our hotspots and in our traveling that we have done, there have been a couple times that we were in areas where we didn't have service, um, place in Colorado, a couple times in remote places in Alaska, uh, we didn't have service, but for the most part, we've had service everywhere we've gone, uh, typically enough for us to get our work done as we needed to. Um, I've seen a lot of chatter online uh, that the Starlink satellite internet service is really good for uh, our viewers, that they like the speeds. Uh, I think it's maybe a little more on the pricier end than a cellular data plan, but uh, if it's more reliable, then that might be worth it for you. So um, I would go to the experts on this one. They're going to be able to give more of the details, upload speeds, download speeds, um, the different carriers that are out there. Uh, they're going to have more of the details on that. So rvmobileinternet.com. Uh, Chris and Cherie are the uh, couple that uh, provides the information and, and they do a lot of videos and stuff too if you prefer video over uh, text articles. So uh, check them out. They're on YouTube as well. Uh, like I said, they make a lot of videos. All right. So you guys, that was all the questions that were submitted ahead of time. Um, I have no idea what time it is, likely probably been about 90 minutes or so. Um, so <laughs> hopefully I covered everybody's questions pretty good. But if not, definitely feel free to reach out to us here at WordCamper News if you do have more questions or wanna uh, talk through some more things. Uh, WordCamper.com is our online home. You'll find um, our email and our website, our email and our phone number there on our website. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. But uh, yeah, lots of job finding tools. We have more job listings and a larger variety uh, than you'll find anywhere else for work campers. And kind of like I showed you guys a little bit, lots of videos. We also have online courses, um, articles. Uh, we have the Work Camper Show podcast that's available to you guys for free. You can also read articles on our free blog, goneworkcamping.com. Um, and follow us on Facebook, uh, Instagram. Uh, we do a little bit of YouTube videos, not a whole lot of YouTube videos yet. So um, yeah, uh, those of you who are online live with us, if you guys have any questions, uh, nobody submitted anything in so far, but um, any last minute inputs, I'm happy to answer anything maybe we didn't cover today. Um, this is probably our 15th or 16th Q&A session that we've recorded. Uh, all of those are in the YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash work camper. Uh, you'll find our Q&A playlist there on our channel and you can go back through. We've answered a lot of different questions, uh, some similar questions every time, but also uh, different questions every time. And uh, I think of different things all the time. So uh, even if the same questions asked, I might have said something different last time. So it can't hurt to go back and uh, give it a listen. Uh, so yeah, well, thanks everyone so much for joining us. Uh, I hope this has been helpful for you and uh, I hope you will consider becoming a Work Camper News member. Uh, we are passionate about helping you live this Work Camper lifestyle successfully. So uh, with that, I wish you happy Work Camping and safe travels.